So hello everyone and good morning Linda um, in the US. Um, so this morning I'm in conversation with Linda Beck in the US. So we're going to talk about virtual exchange in your institution, Linda. But before we go ahead, please introduce yourself. Tell us who you are, where, which, what is your institution, what's your role? Certainly. So thank you, first of all, for inviting me here today. I appreciate that. Um, I am a political scientist, so I'm a professor of political science, but my current position at the University of Maine at Farmington is as the Associate Dean of Experiential and Global Education. So promoting a virtual education comes under my, my office's responsibility. So thank you for your time today, Linda. So with your um, relationship with Uni Collaboration goes back quite a few years and your, you and your colleagues have undertaken um, some training with us over the years. Would you like to outline the origins of your virtual exchange programs at Maine Farmington? Certainly. Um, I feel quite fortunate to have learned about virtual exchanges before COVID. A lot of my colleagues became aware of it after. And at the time, I was looking for opportunities for our students who are 50% um, of them are first generation and 50% of them, are, meaning that they're the first one in their family to go to college and 50% uh, somewhat overlapping are what we call in the United States Pell Grant recipients. That means that they're low income. Mm -hmm. And so for a lot of these students, the possibility of studying overseas, even in our short term courses, is just not financially possible, not only because of the cost, but also because of the opportunity cost, because they work one or maybe even two jobs, right? Wow. So wow. I was looking for them to be able to have um, sustained conversations with colleagues overseas. And uh, I had the good fortune of being on an administrative Fulbright in Japan. And while I was there um, in Osaka, I the wonderful center that's there, I learned about um, virtual exchanges. And uh, then the university, we applied for funding, which I think is really important um, from the US government under our, our undergraduate international studies and foreign language program. And um, we applied literally, literally as COVID was hitting the United States. I was scrambling in 2020 of March of 2020 to bring people back from various different places. And it was at that moment that we put in for our, our virtual exchange funding for our virtual exchange program. So that's the origin of it. I understand the importance of the funding. Can I just go back a step and ask you, so the origins um, was clearly around the funding. What do your virtual exchange programs look like within your institution now? How are they structured? Are they embedded? Are they separate? What, what versions are you using? That's a really good question. So um, we are actually, uh, we started with just embedding modules of at least five weeks long in existing classes and um, have worked with our colleagues to identify collaborators. Sometimes it's someone they've worked with for a number of years, sometimes including one of the unit collaboration conferences led to a current ongoing collaboration with two Italian colleagues who are actually coming here at the end of March with um, with students. So it's very That's exciting. Wonderful. So it's, it's, it's transformed into an actual physical mobility. Exactly. They're starting this semester with a, um, a, a uh, virtual exchange, and they had actually done it also in the, the fall of 22. The same professors had done it, different students, same professors. And now they're doing it where the students are actually physically going to come here. And in fact, that's what we're trying to do is promote more what we call global seminars that have a component where the students um, have a virtual exchange experience and then some type of mobility. So we, um, we did that with uh, Japan last, spring, last fall. And we are doing that with the Italian where our students went to Japan. We are doing that with these Italian students that are coming here. The really cool thing that I just got off the call with uh, our colleagues in France, we are starting our virtual exchange in mid-March with them. And then our students in May will go to France. And at the end of May, they will come here. So I'm hearing Japan, France, and Italy, Linda. So are these um, language exchange students or is there an element of other content? For example, some colleagues have spoken about business students 
environment, geography, so using English for specific purposes, for example, what's the nature of your your the content of your virtual exchanges? Yeah, the edu the actually la language has been a um, a minority of our virtual exchanges. Uh, we had one between a Spanish class and um, an English class in Spain, and we do have an ongoing one between um, uh, our multi-language learner. Court. We, we teach uh, teachers to work with multi-language learners, and they are collaborating with a group in Cyprus, and they've done this is the third year running that they've been doing that. But all of the other ones are um, uh, anthropology, political science, geography, music psychology so like all across the board um, so interdisciplinary approach has been the way forward for you absolutely and how how um you know these are notoriously challenging to set up so and also um when we train um inviting academics to to see that it doesn't necessarily just have to be language that you can do the interdisciplinary approach so what are some of the challenges that you've faced on a personal level and within your institution in in getting people on board because it's a lot of extra work at the end of the day as well isn't it oh my gosh it has to be a passion right because yes. there's so much work that's involved one of the advantages of having the grant that i mentioned um and we just received we received one in 2020 and we just received another one in 23 um, permits me to provide faculty members and our international partners with a stipend. So it doesn't fully cover all the costs, but it's an acknowledgement of the extra work that they, right. they do. Um, and then we also have some additional funding for technology. So like we've purchased something that here, at least in the United States, we call owls. They're like these little, they kind of look like owls that turn in a classroom so that whoever's speaking right um <laughs> so, you know we we've we've invested in a few things like that to to enhance it um uh the i would say the two biggest challenges are the challenges that everyone faces which is of course first and foremost language and so we're the conversation i was just having with our french colleagues you know um english has been the medium of instruction uh, of exchange in all of them but we have to face the fact that our colleagues, first of all, it's not even fair to, right. for us to do anything, right? Yes. And then also it, um, there's varying levels in any individual class, right? Yes. In, amongst whether it's Peruvian or Senegalese or, or French or Japanese, the, 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 our colleagues, um, students have varying levels of English. So putting together different, using different kinds of technologies to have instantaneous types of translation, um, using everything from, you know, chats where you type the English so that they can actually translate. Like we we have tried everything. Wow. Every, yeah. And what's the most? What's the best thing to, to? I mean, obviously, there's always varying levels of English and other languages. What have you found the most effective way of ensuring that there's kind of a a, a decent flow of, of of communication and information with so regards to language problems? It's, by the way, I am so open. I'm hoping to listen to other colleagues talk about this so that I can hear what other people have come oh, up yes. with. Um, I think that, you know, one of the things that we attempt to do is, um, is take a multi uh, approach. So uh, embedding an instructor or a student that has good bilingual skills is, is really helpful. Yes. So um, that's one, one thing. Um, I try not to, we try not to do that too much on a burden on a single student because we don't want to turn a student into a translator, right? Um, so that is one thing though, embedding somebody is is one of the things that we attempt to do. I think the other thing that we have attempted is um, using different technology. We have found it challenging in the United States. Google um, does not, has excellent translation if we were sitting in Canada. But in the United States, they, for whatever reasons, have not opened up Translate. Yeah, but I have imagined that most of my colleagues in Europe are not aware of this. You no, folks absolutely not. We assume yeah. that it's all open. Yeah. Oh, yeah. that's and interesting. It, and it is in Canada, but it isn't in the United States. Mm. So we are actually exploring using, um, uh, um, oh, shoot, now the name of the platform just went meet, meet. I'm trying to think of what the name of it is. Anyway, we're trying to use another platform to see right. whether or not that, that can um, work. The other thing that we try to do, and as I said, students themselves, we've watched this. They 
have a hard time. I, I've watched this actually repeatedly in our classes, especially with Japanese students. Um, they'll ask our students to type it into the 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 chat, and then they are taking a picture of it and translating it. Right. So right. like we're we're a bit laborious, isn't it? <laughs> very laborious. Very laborious. But you know what? Quite honestly, um, I do hope that we can improve the the language um, issues, address it better. But there is something to be said for our students, um, especially American students, to recognize to recognize the challenges uh, involved with working in in different linguistic communities. Um, as you know, uh, Americans are notorious for not learning another language and being quite isolated from other languages, even more so than, say, our Canadian colleagues who at least have French, right? Yes. And you would think with our Spanish that would make us more bilingual, but it, it isn't. So I am just pleased that our students are trying to figure out, okay, how do I address these not only cultural differences, but linguistic differences, and ho hopefully encourage them to, to study languages. I'm, I'm interested in what you're saying about that because over here now with um, Dr. Miriam Hauk and Dr. Francesca Helm, they've been working a lot on the issue of decolonizing the curriculum. And I'm, I'm, I'm wondering if that's a thing in the United States, is that something you are um, experiencing or considering or is it still something yet to, to spread? No, we're actually, especially, so we, just to be clear, so we have um, partners in Asia, Africa, uh, Latin America, and Europe, yeah. as well as we work with um, a tribal college here in, in the United States. Um, so um, I would say that the, the challenges we face with our colleagues in, um, in Peru and, and Senegal is trying to make sure equal access to resources, like that we're not using technology that they don't have access to, right? To try and 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 ensure that um, in the case of the, the Senegalese exchange, it's with an English class. So it's in their interest who speaks English and to use English. But I'm so glad you, you mentioned this because one of the other things I've done in the new grant is we are creating modules so that our students learn um, I'm working with uh, two Quebec uh, colleague, colleagues of mine. We have a series of five modules to learn some basic French so that my students at least are making an effort, right? Yeah. <laughs> right. It, at the very least, they're making an effort. And that's our plan is to ensure that there's at least some, in, in my opinion, the modules at least give our students a sense of, my goodness, it is amazing how these colleagues are speaking in English when I'm having a hard time even saying, hello, how are you? Do you have any brothers and sisters? <laughs> so. Well, Linda, before I, I let you go, is there something else, any insights or something else you'd like to share with our listeners before I let you go for the day? Is there anything I, I should have asked you that I haven't asked you? No, but I think your future plans, I'm hearing... Um, you're trying to improve the language situation. Is there anything else that you need to, uh, that you're thinking and needing to overcome in the future? That's a, a really good question. And I would say one of the things we're doing with our new grant from the US government, by the way, if there are any Americans listening to it, they should definitely <laughs> apply for this grant to get some funding. Um, uh, the other thing that I would say is that the way in which our, our grant is um, working for this last uh, session, this latest um, grant, is we're focusing on um, students in natural sciences and education because those are two areas that are least likely to have exposure to international and global studies and foreign language. And so I'm hoping that I can reach out to UNI collaboration colleagues in especially those fields. Thank you so much, Linda, for your time today. My pleasure, my pleasure.